round rock on the beach. And everybody has that big yellowy glow to them. That's pure gold. Hey guys, what's up? Morgan Shapiro here with Wow Earth, sponsored by Michelob Ultra Pure Gold in honor to celebrate Earth Day and our planet. So it is very crucial that all of you guys register to win free prizes at wowmbs.com forward slash earth. Big thank you to Mind Body Social, Michelob Ultra, Baptist Health, and Florida Blue for allowing us to be here today. So where are we today? Today we are at the Zoo Miami's Conservation Action Center. And today we are gonna go find Christina to learn a little bit more about what all of this is about. Follow me. Hey guys, good news. I found Christina. Let's go see what she has to say. Hey Christina. Hi. How are you? Good, good. And yourself? I'm very good. good. So tell me, what is it exactly that you do here? I'm exhibits manager here, so I'm in charge of bringing in traveling exhibits, or dinosaurs or reptiles, and also designing here the conservation actions. So well, as it comes to the python, what are some things we can do differently to help with all of that? Choosing pets wisely is really important. If you have um, finding out what species, how big they're gonna get right. and what they need to eat because sometimes some of these pythons were released and they do really well in this climate. So they just grow and grow and they're eating all of our native animals. Right, and we, we can't have that, Absol absolutely not. <laughs> okay, so that's the python. Now tell me a little bit more about this place, what it has to offer and the, walk me through a little bit of The it. Conservation Action Center is really all about conservation. Okay. It's a one-of-a-kind exhibit solely on conservation, what zoos do for conservation and what our zoo does. So there's many conservation programs that are highlighted here, okay. what you can do in your own habitat or home to help. Mm -hmm. And we just have, for example, the Florida's Most Wanted. These okay. are some of the invaders. Here you can see cane toad, black and white tegu, Burmese python, lionfish, the iguanas that you okay. see everywhere. These are some of the species that are doing this same thing. So um, invading, like similar to the python. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we touch on their their crimes. It's really funny because it's like a wanted poster. <laughs> and so what what are they doing that's so horrible? I mean, it seems like they're innocent animals living their lives. So why are they invaders? Why are they the most wanted? Explain that a little bit more to me. They are. They don't know. They're, it's not their fault. Right. They're just living their life here. Okay. But they are, for example, the tegu will eat anything. It'll go into your chicken coop and eat eggs and things like that. Right. The cane toad can poison your dog. And oh. those are um, invasive species. Right. Lionfish um, eats some of our reef fish. The green iguana eats a bunch of flowers and different things. And they grow and they do very well here, too. And they're also in invasive species. Okay, so again, it's just people being educated on what pets they get. Don't mm -hmm. aimlessly release these out into the wild right. because we can only handle a certain amount of them because they are doing some damage to the other animals and the habitats and everything. Absolutely. Okay. And we have some um, live animals here that represent though. We have a, we have a red-tailed boa that is also one of the invasive species and the Argentine tegu. So we use those as ambassador animals. Okay. So we bring them out and teach the public about those. Is there any way you can show those to me? Yes. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> let's check, check it out this way. I see there's one right here. Yes. So what is this? this I is would our... say bad boy, but I'm not sure. <laughs> it's She's a, a good girl. Her name She's is She's a good girl, okay. <laughs> She's an Argentine black and white tegu. Wow. And she is one of our ambassador animals, so she's used to being handled. Okay. 
She's like a big baby, but mm -hmm. a really nice representation of the species. And you can find these throughout South Florida now. And they eat just about anything. So. Where would you find them in South Florida? Like in Some the... people have found them in their backyards eating dog food out of the dog bowl. So eating eggs, wow. eating whatever they can really get their hands on. They're pretty. Oh my gosh. And, and they're, they're very strong. Mm -hmm. So the they population is increasing, you would say? I would say. Yeah. Okay, yeah, if you're finding them in your backyard. Some I people have, yeah. Sometimes they're wow. hard to find, but these guys, and they grow very big and they can get huge. They wow, get and chunky. could they be of danger to small animals? They can. Okay. I mean, she looks super sweet, but you This know. one is, yeah. <laughs> okay. But they eat alligator eggs, a bunch of different things. So they are also causing a few problems for us, but okay. she is beautiful though. Right, we're treating them <laughs> with love and care, but also educating people on them and having them, how to handle them, and what to do if you encounter one, yes. I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome, and you said there was a second one? Yes. All right, let's see. This is this is a boy or a girl? Tail boa. Okay. This one, I believe, is a boy. Okay. Oh, it's I about see to them. shed, so you can see the cloudy eyes. That's yes. when they're about to shed. So these are beautiful. The red tail boas are also similar to the, a lot smaller than the Burmese python, but they're also being, um, they're invading this territory because, again, with our climate and our food sources, they do very well here. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh wow, he is beautiful. Very cool. I did not know, know that their eyes got glossy right before they they're cloudy they shed right before one. they're going to shed, and after they shed, they look beautiful. Okay. They're very bright and colorful. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And you'll take these out in we'll this and allow people to touch and, them and yes, yes, with and just teach people about them, and they're allowed to see them up close, so right. they get a real up close and personal treat, you know, with the animal. Right. And I imagine the more that you have those personal experiences, especially visual and touch. It would at least intrigue me to learn more, see what I can do to help, become more fascinated, and also treat these animals with such care if I do encounter them. Maybe I won't be as afraid if I learned about them before. Yes. So this is all a great thing you guys are doing. Thank you. It's building empathy, really. For once you yes. know the animal and you know more about them, you, you can respect them, learn about them, right. and um, hopefully help. Right. See what you can do to help on both ends. Yes. Awesome, okay, I know there was another thing you wanted to show me over here. Well, fun. Okay, we I'm have, all for this fun. Is a very interactive <laughs> exhibit, so we just didn't want to kind of have um, a lot of text and things like that. So right. the, inter the interactivity of this exhibit was paramount when we were designing this. So we wanted okay. it to be learning through play. I love so that. So we really have a That's lot of interactives where you can get physical and do some, like for example, there's a whack-a-mole and it's knocked back the threats to wildlife. So you okay. see <laughs> habitat loss, poaching, pollution, different things like that. So you just turn it on and then you can whack away these threats to wildlife. Okay. So you want to give it a try? Okay, yes, but I have a question. <laughs> so there's two buttons, adults and kids. What's the difference? Sometimes I act like a child. I'm not really sure. <laughs> so if you want to go slow. Oh, no, no, no. But adult if you want fast. some more action, then press the adult. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Very cool. Good job. Wow. Not bad, not bad. I love it. And I know, you know, speaking of passion, we all are very passionate about these mm -hmm. things. So you're able to express that emotion, knock out pollution. Like, yeah, we come all around here things. and we're like, whoa, that guy really feels it because they just. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I know you said with learning, it, it breaks it up, it's more mm -hmm. fun. You go from listening to being physical, which is always a great thing to seeing things, so this, this exhibit has it all. I'm a big fan. Thank you so much. Big fan. We're very awesome. proud of it. Awesome, I love it. All right, so let's head over let's to head the over. last thing. Sure. Yeah, a lot of visuals in here. The colors are great. Yeah, it's bright. Absolutely. We want it to be very inviting mm -hmm. and interactivity. Things to read, screens to see. We have a bit of all of it. Mm -hmm. So now, where to next? We're gonna go to the front and look at our we're gonna go on this golf cart and yeah. see Kibby yes. in the nutrition center. Hello, Kibby. Hello, welcome. Thank you so much. So where are we headed to now? We are headed to Zoo Miami Nutrition Center. All right, you're gonna give me a ride there. Absolutely. All right, let's do it. Hey guys, we are here with Kibby, who is the zoo nutritionist 
And where are we today, Kitty? Where are we at this moment? So this is the Nutrition Center for Zoo Miami. This is where we stock the food, we check in the food, and we prepare the diets for all of the animals in the zoo. Okay, very cool. So I understand that there's not many zoo nutritionists in the country. How did you become a zoo nutritionist and what is that process even like? Because I didn't know that was a thing before coming here, honestly. I also did not know it was a thing <laughs> until I was finishing up my PhD in uh, horse nutrition and exercise. Okay. And I was working with ponies and race horses and looking at how they were different. And I thought, what about zebras? What are we feeding to our zebras? And the whole world opened up for me. And my background was in horses, but you could have a background in human nutrition and come and do food for primates. Over here, we're making some primate brownies, which are special recipes to help feed some of our older primates. Okay. So we can use a variety of backgrounds. Being in a zoo is about being creative, solving problems, and finding and learning really interesting things about really interesting animals. Very cool. So what is your day-to-day -day like here? I mean, I see we're prepping some food behind. Do you, you're in charge of creating the diets. Correct. Does that change, or what is your day like? So my day is extremely busy okay. and highly varied, and I'm always learning things. So as you see, I have a full staff here that's making 500 diets every day. Wow. This is the most important thing because this is what goes to the animals, to their table, and make sure that they are healthy and getting the food that they need. I then go to my computer, do a whole bunch of math to calculate out the calcium requirements, the protein requirements, the energy requirements for these animals to give them the information they need to make cutting edge diets for our animals. Okay, and I'm sure a lot of that too will change depending on the time for the animals, like different times of year, maybe they need more, they need less, is that? Absolutely, so animals also move through the zoos, they right. go to different groups, they merge with other diets or other animal groups. Sometimes they go to the hospital and need special care. Sometimes they have a baby, sometimes they are a baby and they're growing, so all of those things are gonna change. I do diet changes on a daily basis. I do on average, I think two to five diet changes every day. Wow. And and so that becomes hundreds and hundreds of diet changes over a year period. We have almost 4,000 animals in the zoo, so it keeps me pretty busy. Wow, I would say your days are probably pretty long. So can you walk me through a little bit about what exactly goes on here besides some food prep? What different departments do you have? I see vegetables, I know there's some meat. Correct, we so we run this as you would run a human kitchen or a restaurant. Okay. So we wanna make sure we have different stations for different food items. We avoid cross-contamination. We do a lot of cleaning dishes, cleaning surfaces to make sure that we have the sanitation. But staff also is responsible for checking in food items, for ordering food items, for finding new food items. So we are constantly helping to work, increase our stock, increase the variability, find sources that are sustainable, available, healthy okay. for animals, and of course that are cost effective as well. Okay, awesome. So as you know, we're here for Wow Earth, you know, in honor of Earth Day. So can you talk to me a little bit more about the sustainability food choices and why is it so important to have sustainable food as it pertains to our planet and the animals? Absolutely, we are of course conservation based. Our whole mission is involved in the animals and of course the animals and our relationship with them, their relationship with the planet and how we work together. Right. So here we do hundreds of diets, as I mentioned, thousands of pounds of diets, a million dollars of food. Food is such a huge, important resource for us and for our animals and our planet. So we want to make sure our animals get what they need, but also that we're not utilizing resources that animals in the future won't have available. So when we're feeding something like pelicans, polar bears, sea lions, um, we may be feeding lots and lots of fish and we have to make sure that that fish that we're getting is going to be available for future. It's going to be available for polar bears in the wild. It's going to be um, something that we can get cost effective, that we can make hundreds of diets every day with it. So we definitely want to look and, and try and use the resources available like Seafood Watch right. to try to find the most sustainable, the fishing uh, that's going to be less damaging to the environment, less damaging to those populations and make sure that they are here for years and years to come, just as we want to make sure our tiger populations are here for years and years to come. Right, a lot of variables go into it. So now when it comes to the seafood, do you know in particular if you guys do wild caught or farm raised or what so, the, that's the difference some people are, I know are very confused with that and what's better for them. Correct, and there are so many variables that go into that. So some of our fish is wild caught and some of it is farm raised. So a lot of it depends upon the technology that we have available, how those farms may operate. So for example, we've been working with several local farms for uh, some seafood, some fish items. In their process of producing the food items for people, for the table, they have a lot of fish that are cold because they're not quite the right size. Right. Well, we've got animals this big, animals this big, animals this big, animals this big, they're gonna eat all sizes of fish. So we are able to utilize those fish that are not gonna make it to the table to feed our animals. And actually we did a feeding last week with our giant otters that got some great big fish. And it was really, really exciting for the public and of course for us to see as well. And for the animals to really get a new product that was a food that's 
happens to be a delicacy for people and apparently for otters also. Oh, wow, very cool, getting a little fancy. So would you say, I know people, the animals are concerned about sustainable seafood, and so are people who are shopping in the grocery store. Now, do you know of certain fishes that are maybe easier to get more sustainably? You know, different so, species of fish? Mm -hmm, absolutely, one of our primary feeder fish in the zoos is the capelin. Okay. So this is also a byproduct of an industry, a human industry, which is the caviar industry. Okay. So those female fish are gonna be used for the caviar industry, but the male fish are potentially a waste product. And so we feed lots of those to our animals um, and they provide obviously lots of protein nutrition, lots of um, fat nutrition as well for our animals to make sure that they get the fish that is similar to what they have in the wild, but also one that's not going to impact the wild as much in the future. Okay, very cool. So now I understand you, you do your job clearly about taking care of the animals, taking care of our planet. Do you have any last tip or giveaway for everyone at home how they can do their job as it pertains to nutrition and food and sustainability. Absolutely. My job, as I mentioned, is very, you have to be creative, you have to be constantly learning, and I think the same thing applies when we're thinking about ourselves right. or whether we're thinking about an anteater. We want to be able to uh, utilize the resources that are available, find the resources that are going to be least detrimental to the environment, and sometimes we have to be really creative with that, and we also have to go out and constantly seek information, learn the new information that's coming out, and maybe, if you're like me, a little nerdy, you can be one of the scientists that is trying to advance that information so that we have it and everybody else has it for the future, um, so we improve our relationship with our environment and our animals. All right, welcome to our freezer. <laughs> As you'll notice, it's minus nine degrees. It is pretty chilly. Uh, this is the coolest cool. place in Zoo Miami. <laughs> All right, so I would say let's chill out and take our time, but it's pretty freezing. So give me the That's quick right. rundown of what we're working with in here. So we have lots of different items because we have lots of different animals. We have a wall of fish over here where we have fish from three inches to, well, our salmon's actually over here, but it's about three feet long. So depending upon the animal we're feeding, that also means a different variety of fats and, and uh, proteins for animals. More protein sources, we have everything from small, pro, small whole prey items to large rabbits. Again, to feed different sizes, different tastes, different natural adaptations. We also have lots of variety that we use for our high variety of animals. Um, so many different types of items, either that may serve as a nutritional component or as a med vector, something that will convince them to take something that maybe doesn't taste quite as good, but it's important to their health. Very cool, quite the variety. Yep, Small we, and big, I can see. <laughs> we also have a lot of bones. You can see some in the containers here. These are our smallest bones, up to full carcass pieces that may be 50 pounds at a time. A lot of these items are important for the animals to do their natural feeding behaviors. Right. So just as with our fish, that's gonna be feeding our fish eaters right. that in the wild would be biting up those heads, ripping off the tails, right. crunching and spitting out the scales. We wanna make sure they have like all that. They really are in the wild and having that same Absolutely, experience. that's a very important thing to us at the zoo is trying to um, utilize their adaptations, meet their needs, um, but also encourage them to be as natural as they are in the wild. Very, very cool. I'm a big fan. <laughs> Pretty cold though. So. Literally cold. I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna head out. <laughs> wow, what an experience. That was absolutely amazing. Big thank you to Mind Body Social, Michelob Ultra, Pure Gold, Zoo Miami, Baptist Health, and Florida Blue. And big thank you to all of you guys for watching.